So before I get, begin, I want to say hello to all my friends, or all our friends out there in the virtual world. And um, we are a work in progress. We're working it today. So it looks a little funny. Just bear with us. We're going to try to make it work. And uh, we'd love to hear from you about what you think and your experiences. With that in mind, um, it also feels really good to be back on, on, my, on my lecture. It feels like an old friend. Uh, I haven't been on in a while. We're trying to, you know, we're always working something. But, you know, that's the whole thing about freedom. That's been our theme for the month, is there really is no freedom without agility or novelty um, or flexibility. But these are sort of baked into the whole concept of freedom or liberation. You know, the death knell of any act of freedom is to try to institutionalize it, right? Because as soon as you try to anchor it in, to try to make it predictable and, you know, to, to, to have it conform to you, then it's no longer freedom. So freedom has a messiness to it. It has a wildness to it. Uh, it, has, um, it has a novelty to it. So we're kind of, we're, we're kind of working in that one. Then. And um, um, I was uh, taken with the song, uh, the, the Circle Game, because um, there's something going on this week, uh, something known as Lamas or Lunesha. It's a, it's a Celtic festival, and it's considered one of the one of the gates of power in the in the circle of the year. If one thinks about it, there are of course uh, in in um, in more earth centered such as the Celts. And, and, and Neo Wiccans, um, there is there is uh, points within the circle of the year. There is the summer and winter solstice. They're the most obvious. That is uh, the, the shortest day and the longest day. And midway between those are the equinoxes. Again, pretty easy to see, you know. So we have winter solstice, summer solstice, we have autumnal equinox, and we have spring equinox. And then the midpoint between those are what are considered uh, other celebrations or festivals, and those are those are really considered the gates of power. And so, midway between um, the autumnal equinox and uh, the winter solstice is a festival known as uh, Samhain. Um, it is considered the time when the veil between the two worlds is the closest. We know it as the Feast of All Hallows. We know it as the Day of the Dead, so there's an energy about that. And then midway between the winter solstice and the spring equinox is a festival known as Imbolc, or Candle Mass. And it is uh, when the light is beginning to become more. It's becoming more, more, more powerful. And so it's that midway between the winter solstice and the summer solstice. And then midway between the spring equinox and um, the summer solstice is Beltane. You know, Beltane's a great time. It's time to paint yourself blue and dance around the fires and go for it. It's a fertility festival, and it's, you know, we've sort of tried to westernize it by uh, maples and that kind of stuff. <coughs> and then midway between the summer solstice and um, the spring equinox, where we are right now, it's called Lamas, or Lunesha. It's, uh, it's called the Festival of the First Fruits because it's kind of the beginning of the harvest. It's the time that we, we begin to see the fruits of our labors and the gardens and that kind of stuff. You may be thinking to yourself, you know, why does that matter to us? You know, we're mental scientists, we're this, we're that. You know, it matters because, uh, first of all, we, we live on a planet called Earth, and uh, we have a physical body that is a living, breathing part of this thing called Earth. And it's a body, it's a form that is in tune to times and seasons, years and cycles. So whether we like it or not, whether we try to uh, insulate ourselves from the natural rhythms of things, they are there nonetheless. And, and sometimes true freedom is working with something as opposed to pretending it's not there or working against it. The other thing about it is, is because it's in the collective so deeply, it's literally baked into our cultural DNA. Um, that, it, that it's, a, it's, a, it's a story, it's a legend, it's a unifying myth that connects us. It connects us to all living people, all living beings, actually, because we, we celebrate these things. As Joseph Campbell says, when we, when we celebrate a festival or a ritual, we become part of a myth. 
So it's a sense of connecting us to all livingness. It gives us an opportunity for us to remember that we're part of this beautiful thing called a living planet and that we're participating in that as opposed to trying to, um, you know, look at everything as a opportunity to profit from, to commodify something, rather to look at how we participate with things and, and how that unites us. And one of the beautiful things about this festival in particular is because it's the time of harvest, it's also the time of assessment. What I mean by assessment is the kind of that we, we kind of pause and take a look. How are things working? You know, because, you know, as Dr. Holmes says, you know, we, we, we know when something's working, when we see the demonstration in it. We, we know that what we're doing is bearing fruit if we are seeing the fruit being examined. So it's a really good time for all of us personally then to sort of assess where we are and how things are and make adjustments accordingly to what that would be. I don't know about you, but I know that I've been doing a lot of that lately, and I just kind of think it's in the air, right? I'm just kind of looking at these kinds, is this working for me? Is this not working for me? Why do I keep doing the same thing? You know, why do I keep going to the hardware store for milk? You know, it's, why do I do these kinds of things? So I've been sitting with this, and um, what I'm realizing in this whole conversation that I've been having with you this month on liberation, I have been a bit animated. Um, one could say that there might be something underlying near there. Maybe it even sounds like I've been angry. Um, and I've been sitting with that. It's like, am I really angry? Well, you know, I'm edgy. That's true. But I don't know if it's really, I mean, anger is, anger is usually secondary because there's usually something else going on. So I was just kind of sitting with that. And what I realized that deeper than the anger is the grief, is the, the disappointment in things, is the sense of, of just what I'm taking in. So there is this great Talmudic saying. I, uh, I read this the other day in a, in a book by Mitch Horowitz. And he's talking, you know, the, the, the Talmud is this great ancient book of wisdom. It is a commentary on the Torah. So it, it comes from the Jewish tradition, and it's a commentary on the Torah, and then it's commentaries on the commentaries of the Torah. So it's vast and rich, and it's really interesting. But there's this one uh, many, many years ago, probably a couple centuries ago, actually, uh, one, uh, a particular um, Talmudic scholar was with his students, and he said, can anyone tell me the nature of someone who is evil. So what is it about a person that we would call evil, he asks. So his disciples started giving the regular <laughs> answers, you know, it's someone who's pro-vax or it's someone who's anti-vax, it's someone who voted for Trump, it's somebody who voted for Biden, it's a Democrat, it's a Republican, it's a whatever, it's this, that, the other thing. They're evil, right? And then one of his students said, the nature of evil is one who borrows and does not return. And the rabbi said, yes, because all these other things fit in that. So breathe this in for a moment. The nature of evil is one who borrows but does not return. And we can kind of see how that plays itself out in things that are broken in the world, right? We see this in, in personalities. We see this, you know, if we look at climatic, you know, climate change, we have borrowed from the world without returning. We see this in human trafficking. It is borrowing the vitality of that life and not returning it. We can just see it over and over and over again. And, and this has been the thing that has just been what I have been just deeply grieving. Because like you and I, we have been taught, I have been taught, you know, to, to believe in the systems, you know, trust science, trust religion, trust politics, trust this, trust that the systems work. And yet time and time again, 
we found how they betrayed us. You know, how science has betrayed us because of its tendency towards corruption. Religion, for sure. Politics, economics. You know, wherever it goes. So there's this line from Frederick Nietzsche. I'm not upset that you lied to me. I'm upset that from now on I can't believe you. I'm not upset that you lied to me. What I'm upset about is that I can no longer believe you. And that's a, that's a pain. That's the grief that I'm feeling. That's what I'm feeling. It's not so much that I've been lied to. But it's that all these things that I believed in, I can no longer trust. And maybe you're experiencing that in some way for yourself, you know, that, that what you may be feeling in this time is that things that you had invested in, and you realize that there's been a betrayal in, it's now you can no longer, it's changed that whole relationship. So what do you even begin to do with that? Years ago, back in the 90s, actually, there was a book by a woman by the name of Beth Hedba. And, and I remember this book was called The Journey from Betrayal to Trust. And it's a, it's a real interesting process, and I, and I believe I'm going to start reading it again. But, uh, uh, you know, because what she's basically saying is that whenever we experience betrayal, it's a crossroads for us. Because we either want to, or we will either deflect and withhold, or we will go deeper. And the thing about going deeper is, if we want to go deeper, is forgiveness. And you know, and of course, this is the message of Jesus right there. And so, so the invitation is that, you know, something that Abraham Maslow says, you will either step forward into growth, or you will step, step back into safety. And let's face it, liberation, Freedom is not safe. It's messy. Loving is not safe. It's radical. It's rebellion. It's revolutionary. Forgiveness is not safe. So it's about how we live an undefended life despite what is going on. Despite it. And when we look at great spiritual teachers, this is, this is their message all the time. If we want to be truly free, we can no longer encompass ourselves on that which has betrayed us because we will eventually become the thing we push against. Richard Rohr, a, a contemporary Franciscan priest, says it this way. He says, we all become well-disguised mirror images of anything that we fight too long or too directly. That which we oppose determines the energy and frames the questions after a while. So do you see what that means? It's like when we're, when we're stuck on that, when we're constantly fighting something, pushing against something, we become that. We become that. And if we look at the nation that we're in today, you know, that's exactly where we are. We, we're all caricatures of the same things. Now, I'm not a big conspiracist fan. I, I just don't think that. Um, it's not like I don't think people don't want to do these things. I just don't think we're that competent to pull half of these things off. But what I do know, which is obvious, uh, is that the whole thing, and what I mean by that, is the whole messaging that we hear is one about polarization, distrust, and hate. As if people that disagree with us are wrong, are evil, that they borrow and don't return. And that kind of mindset becomes our mindset. And if we're in that, we aren't free. We are in bondage. And so it's up to us, I think, therefore, to kind of begin to break this bondage. So I've been thinking about 
um, you know, next year's theme, because obviously this is bigger than just a Sunday talk uh, or a monthly theme. And, you know, I was telling Michelle, you know, maybe, maybe next year we'll, 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 well, you know, because this year it's been, and it's winding down because we started our annual theme in September. And so I was telling Michelle the other day, you know, um, you know, maybe, maybe next year's theme will be the year of living dangerously. And then I, I, I looked that up and I thought, nah, we're not going there. And, <laughs> not that. But maybe it's a year of living magically. Magically. I love that word, magic. Because, you know, the magic model, the book that we're going to study, the roots of new thought, magic. So what is you know, it's not a hocus pocus kind of things. So, you know, one of my uh, one of my heroes in, in the realm of the Western esoteric tradition, which I'm a student, is this great old gal by the name of Dion Fortune. Dion Fortune is brilliant, she's a great writer. And um, if you read her novels, it's where her greatest teachings are. But uh, but she's she's written other things, so she's written a lot of stuff actually. But uh, but but here's her definition. Magic is the art of causing changes to take place in consciousness in accordance with will. Read that in again. Magic is the art of causing changes to take place in consciousness in accordance with will. Well, anybody that's read Thomas Troward knows that he's practicing this. This is basically the roots of new thought. Because basically what she's saying is by conscious thought, we begin to influence subjective thought. That's like New Thought 101, right? That we can, we can begin to instill a change in consciousness, consciousness defined as awareness of what we're paying attention to, by consciously becoming aware. It's becoming aware of what we're aware of. And it takes effort because it's too easy for me, perhaps for you, to get distracted. And we have a whole system that is built on distraction. It's called social media. It's called the news. It's called, you know, all this stuff that's going on. It is designed to keep us from paying attention to what we're paying attention to. In other words, it's keeping us distracted, which is a form of bondage. And there's no magic in that except the dark arts of, of uh, influencing thought. Um, and we've seen this practiced again and again and again and again. But magic is a personal thing. We support each other, of course, but it is a personal thing. It means applying, engaging, being in. You know, I think what we are up against is nihilism. Because that's what we're being taught. Just give up. Just give in. Just do what you can. Just go to Mars. You know, whatever the case may be, because it, 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 it's, its thing is to make us feel that we're isolated and alone and therefore powerless. And so a simple thing like celebrating a festival with friends, having a meeting to, a meal together, becoming aware, just just practicing these things, coming together, these things begin to build up in us. So, a great mystic teacher of mine, Bernard Sanders, says this, I understand that these are difficult times in so many ways, and that many Americans are demoralized and discouraged. But despair is not an option. We are fighting not only for ourselves, we are fighting for our kids and future generations and for all well-being of the planet. In other words, it goes back to that book from the 90s. You can't afford the luxury of a negative thought. It's indulgent. It's borrowing without ever planning on returning. 
It's borrowing from your consciousness. It's borrowing from the practice of magic without returning it. And we can't afford it. And we're being told that we have no choice, and that's the lie. That we, that we can, we should, we must afford it. And so it's daily. Dr. Holmes says we, we should practice in working in our consciousness daily. What I'm going to offer, what we're going to talk about in the class today, is twice daily, or three times daily, or whatever the case may be. It's just becoming aware when you're aware of when you're aware of it. And, and what begins to happen then? Because what we begin to realize is that we are traveling to a new kind of place. We're going to a new destination. And as Henry Miller says, one's destination is never a place but a new way of seeing things. Yeah. Yeah. That is magic. That is the art of causing changes to take place in consciousness in accordance <coughs> with the will. One's destination is never a place. We go to the same old places all the time until they're brand new for us, right? It is a new way of seeing things. And when we begin to see things from a different perspective, we begin to respond and act differently. And this is something that we have the freedom to choose to do, to act, engage in all the time. So last week I um, offered something from uh, Mr. Rogers. I'll read it again. It says, I believe that appreciation is a holy thing. That when we look for what's best in the person, we're doing what God does. So in appreciating our neighbor, we are participating in something truly sacred. I would add we're participating in something truly revolutionary. I would add that what we're doing is practicing magic. And that's how things begin to change. So um, those who are going to take the class, you're going to be invited in a 40-day practice, um, and then some. But, but what I'm going to offer you guys, what I want to share with you guys today, is a practice that I've taken up. And um, it's part of my morning and evening practice. First thing that I do is I do my malas. And I do my, uh, my mantra, the mantra that we'll learn today. Om Shri Maha Lakshmi uh, Swaha. And here's the thing. If you just heard that and said, I can learn that, that's not true. You can learn that. Want to? It's like reading metaphysical books. Like it's like reading Gurdjieff. Well, I can't read that. Well, yes, you can. You just read it slowly, over and over again. That's how we learn these things. Well, I can never read that. I could never practice that. I could learn that mantra, Om Shri Maha Lakshmi Swaha. I could never learn that's a foreign language. So what? You could learn that. So anyway, Mala practice that 108 times a day. I mean, 108 times. Uh, on the beads, and then the practice is this. This is what I do. So first, I am there, and I think of myself. And I say to myself, may I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be happy. And then I think about my household. I love the dogs, Rolo and Nikolai. Our cat, Sandals, I love him. Our tree, the roses, my beautiful partner, the grass. Everything that I have been entrusted with stewardship over. The grass, the birds, the hummingbirds, the animals. May we all be filled with loving kindness. May we be well. May we be peaceful. Ease. And be happy. And then I think of my neighbors, Jim and Tammy and their children, Jay and his wife, Jim and Kathy, Rick and Jessica, Bob and Vicki, and their households. And I pray for this neighborhood. May we all be filled with loving kindness. May we be well. May we be peaceful. So let's, let's practice that right now. Just center yourself. If you want to close your eyes, do so. If not, you don't have to. But just kind of quietly repeat these words as I sing. 
May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be filled with loving kindness. Or say it out loud. <laughs> May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be happy. May I be happy. And now think of everybody in this room. In fact, just just let yourself just picture everybody in this room. Just bring them all in front of you. And say, may we be filled with loving kindness. May we be filled with loving kindness. May we be well. May we be peaceful and at ease. May we be happy. And now think of everybody in your household. Your partner, the animals, the trees, the plants, the birds, the cats, the fish. Anything and everything that's living in your household. That's part of the stewardship of your life. And say, may we be filled with loving kindness. May we be filled with loving kindness. May we be well. May we be well. May we be peaceful in peace. May we be peaceful in peace. May we be happy. May we be happy. So it is. So it is. Thank you again for being part of our celebration. And you know the drill, like, share, comment. These things are so helpful. They, they work the algorithms to make us more available to more people and it's working. So thank you for that. And again, your financial support is so essential and we're just so grateful for it. So my dear friends, to those whom you love and those whom you receive love from, from the bottom of my heart, I wish you many, many, many blessings.